Okay, great. Let me see. Okay. All right, so I think it's recording. And I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation. So it seems like some of you have not had you know, any direct experience on homelessness, homeless children and youth. And so I'm just, you know, I, I don't mean to sound pedantic or any condescending or anything, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So what I'm going to explain, some of you probably have heard already. Um, and I don't know if you've had a chance to review the, um, the No Barriers um, publication that we released last July. If not, I can, I can send a, a link to it. Um, it gives you an overview of what the legal issues are in this, in this area. Um, it's 200 plus pages, and which is why, you know, I, I think the presentation that we're going to do today will do as not as not if not as better a job, but it will, it will it will try to explain some of the basic issues and sort of get you in the right right mind frame in terms of you know thinking about like what your analysis should be. Um, so let me okay, let me find the let me share my my presentation. With you guys. Can you see the PowerPoint now? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So let me let me start this off. All right. So this is a pre I mean this is a presentation that I've used in like past webinars. So I tweaked a little bit so that it's more tailored to you guys. Um, so we're going to talk about the Education for Homeless Children and Youth program under the McKinney Bento Act today. Um, most folks call it Title Seven or Subtitle Seven of the McKinney Bento. That's the original legislation, but in some states, um, you probably hear it as Title Ten, Part C, and that's because that's the um, No Child Left Behind legislation that re most recently reauthorized um, McKinney th this this uh, this program. So it's either Title Seven. Um, or Title 10 Part C under No Child Left Behind. Um, so we have a lot to talk about today. I'm going to try to keep it under like an hour and 15 minutes because I understand some folks have to go. Um, so you know, we'll talk about some of the background information, and then we'll talk about some of the key provisions. Um, talk about some of the challenges because I think that will you know help you frame what the issues are and why we're actually doing this 50 state analysis. Um, and then we'll talk about the next steps for metrics. Uh, sounds like a plan. Okay, and 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 the reason why we did this through go to meetings because if at any point you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me because um, I'm going to cover a lot of information. So you know, bear with me. But uh, if you have any questions or if, if anything's unclear, just just feel free to shoot me a uh, ask a question, and I'll be happy to answer it as we go along. All right, so before we even go further, I want to make sure that again we're on the same page. So I'll be talking about some background information. Um, homelessness, you know, it can be precipitated by any number of events. It's, you know, you can lose a job, you can have like a medical emergency, you can have a, you can be displaced because of like a hurricane, for example, or you can just have like a foreclosure, um, which is probably most of the number of cases uh, we've seen why people experience homelessness. Um, one of the challenges that we've seen is, uh, for some for some of you who've done work in this area, a lot of people actually think, relate homelessness as to those individuals living on the streets. Um, so those unsheltered folks um, that you see on sidewalks um, holding up, you know, cartons and placards saying that they're asking for money. Um, but under the Department of Education, under the McKinney-Vento Department of Education definition, that's not exactly true. So um, homelessness also includes individuals living with extended family or those living, you know, with living doubled up with relatives, friends, um, living in hotels and motels, among other living arrangements. Um, the first thing to understand about homelessness is that it's really a, mostly a temporary phenomenon for most people. You know, it can happen once or it can occur in multiple episodes. And again, it depends on and it depends on the individual situation. Um, it has many faces. It's not an identity, but rather an experience. And that is the experience of being displaced. So, you know, in our world, we don't really refer to them as the homeless. Uh, we try to explain as you know individuals experiencing homelessness rather than calling them the homeless because again it's not an identity and it's very stigmatizing to call it that. Um, and my point here is that anybody can experience homelessness. You know you can be you can even be a professional with a graduate degree and or be part of the middle class and still end up experiencing homelessness at some point in your life. Um, and for those of you who have worked in shelters before, that you probably see this as true. Some people actually show up. You know they, they stay in shelters. They're homeless, but they also have day jobs. They, you know, they can put on a suit and tie and just 
it's, it's very hard to determine who's homeless and who's not. Um, and it's not just about affordable housing anymore. It's about you know poverty. It's about oppression, inequality, even racial injustice. And there's also access to medical care and treatment. And today we're just going to be talking about the small a small piece of the puzzle, which is access to education. So homelessness is an ongoing crisis. It's placed millions of Americans each year. Um, it has negative and unfortunately it has negative consequences, you know, particularly for youth and young people. Um, and if you read the papers today, you'll see different cities across the United States trying to tackle homelessness. Um, L.A. has been on the news. I think they were going to declare a um, state of emergency, but they did not. Hawaii is the first state to do so. Uh, there are other cities that have declared states of emergency to deal with their homeless, homeless populations. And one of the reasons why this is still happening is, you know, as I'd like to say, homeless uh, recession may have ended and for Wall Street, but not really in Main Street. Um, poverty rates have not changed significantly. The living standards have not improved. Um, wages remain stagnant and individuals experiencing homelessness lack agency. And but what I mean by that is that homelessness really is tied to poverty and poverty is not just about lack of money anymore. It's also about lack of power. So you know, individuals experiencing homelessness don't have the power to do things expected in society. So think about the things that you'd be doing, for example, this coming holiday season, right? Like giving gifts, entertaining friends, going on vacation, hopefully somewhere warmer than D.C. Um, or Chicago. Um, these are things that they can't just simply do because they are in poverty and they're experiencing homelessness. Um so going to the, the, the statistic, focusing on the statistics for child, homeless children and youth, in 2010, 1.6 million or one in every 45 children and youth were found to be homeless. Um, and in 2013, that statistic increased to 2.5 million or one in every um, 30 children and youth. And by children and youth, I'm referring to not just the school age children, but I'm also referring to preschoolers. So those children who are below five, you know, five or below. Um, and to give you a bit more perspective um, about the statistic, if you if you turn that number into the number of homeless, uh, if you turn that number into a state, you know the 2.5 million, that's that will be a 36th largest state in the country by population. And if you turn that into a if you turn that number into a U.S. city, it will be the fourth largest city, just after New York, L.A., and Chicago. So it's a, it's a pretty significant number, and you know, and unfortunately, there's has no, there's been no systematic long-term solutions to this problem, so it's unlikely that the alarming trend will reverse anytime soon. So again, this is just a statistics. Uh, one in 30 children in the U.S. were homeless um, in 2013, and we're predicting that it's just going to keep on rising. And part part of it is because we're thinking that because schools are doing a good job of identifying homeless students, um, and part of it is because of the economy. Um, and before we go further, I just want to say, like, why? So why is this an issue, right? Why is staying in school such a big deal? So, for example, take it. So if you're thinking about like a, a, a family living in you know, Chicago, for example. And they experienced homelessness and the students were and the, the kids are, you know, attending school in Chicago. Um, and they and after they experienced homelessness, they started living doubled up with their family, friends and say like a neighboring suburb. So they moved to the suburb. Right. Let's say suburb B. Um, and but the, the kids want to go still attend the school in Chicago. Well, because some schools are unaware of the law, you know, the, the, the students trying to stay in the, in the Chicago school will be unable to do so because the school will say, well, you're not physically residing in Chicago. You're living in a suburb. So, you know, we, you can't go to our school. You have to go to the, the school in the suburb. But if this, if the kid tries to enroll in the suburb, well, they'll say, you, you don't, you don't have a proof of residency. You're not on a lease. You don't have a utility bill, bill because your parents or your family is like just living doubled up. So we can't enroll you here. So, you, you know, we, some of these kids end up being in limbo and not able to attend any schools at all. So McKinney-Vento is essentially an exception to that rule where you can only attend um, a school where you're, you can only attend a school where you're living, the district that where you're living in. Um, so McKinney-Vento serves as, as an exception to that rule. Um, does that make sense? 
Yeah. Okay. So, you know, staying in school really offers continued educational continuity and stability for many kids, and it really sets them in a path that would help them succeed academically. Um, conversely, you know, if, if you disrupt the school, if, this, if the kids are unable to attend school while they're experiencing homelessness, for example, they're more likely to have poor attendance than other students who have been placed in stable school placements, um, and they're more likely to repeat a grade. So homelessness and poverty is not really rocket science. While solving them may not be as easy, we believe that solutions are available. So here at the Law Center, what we really advocate for is more affordable housing coupled with appropriate services and support. Um, and we believe that these are key to ending homelessness and poverty. So I do apologize. This is, this is um, I'm trying to depict a life cycle here, but clearly I did not do a good job. So I just you know, put a butterfly. Um, Chrysalis. But um, so bear with me for a second. So if you have a child, right, and that child gets to go to school, not disrupt, the schooling does not get disrupted and they get a good education, then they have a better chance of get, you know, being successful in school and being more competitive in the job market. And if they have a better job, that really provides them with stability, and more specifically financial stability. So at some point, they'll probably be able to afford a house or even renting an apartment. So what I'm trying to see here is that obtaining quality education is a vital step to breaking the cycle of extreme poverty and homelessness. So and again, in response to this, you know, this big problem, the Education for Homeless Children and Youth program under Title 7B of the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act guarantees, you know, students um, without fixed adequate nighttime residence, the the right to stay in the same school that they were attending, and the right to receive transportation. And these are the, the two main rights, but there are other rights that we'll be talking about in, in the next couple of slides. And here at the Law Center, as I was referring to before, we published this No Barriers um, publication. It's a legal advocate's guide to ensuring compliance with McKinney Vento. Um, for those of you who want to who want to get some background information, these are just some of the sections. Um, the most relevant to you guys would probably be the you know the first section, so understanding the key concepts and provisions. Um, the first the first part, the appendix also lists the full text of the McKinney Vento Education Law, so you can you, you can take a look at that and see how you know what the important regulations uh, what what the important statutes are. Um, there's also the role of other education related laws and that really enumerates other education related laws and how such you know, rules and laws can benefit homeless children and youth. So, for example, a lot of these homeless kids also end up having um, disabilities. So, you know, there's another law that pertains to those students with disabilities, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And what we find is that there's there's the. the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and McKinney Vento run parallel to each other. So there's a lot of similar provisions um, between those two laws. Um, there's also, if you want to see like what the flavor is of uh, what these things look like in terms of litigation, there's some sample cases that we've you know, collected um, through our partners, and uh, they're, they're listed on the, on the manual as well. So... Real quick, though, why why we had this manual and why we're doing this project now is because, again, there's numerous barriers to enrolling, attending, and participating and staying in school for many kids. Um, and unfortunately, many of these families and children are unaware of their rights, and not just like the schools, but also the families themselves. Um, and more importantly, many of these families lack the access to legal resources and legal representation. So many of these Families who, you know, who encounter these problems don't really have access to an attorney who will be able to defend them uh, or protect their rights. Any questions so far? Sorry, I, I know I'm like going at a fast pace, but um, there are no questions. I'll just keep going. Okay, so who's covered by McKinney Vento? Um, basically, any child or youth experiencing homelessness and that encompasses unaccompanied homeless youth. 
Uh, and what I mean by that is any youth or child who is not in the physical custody of a parent or a guardian. Um, those, they're homeless children awaiting foster care placement, and this actually has caused a lot of confusion um, across the country. And one of the reasons why we're doing this 50 state survey is because we want to see how each state is dealing with awaiting foster care placement. So McKinney Vento is a federal law that says children awaiting foster care placement qualify as homeless and are, are entitled to McKinney Vento um, they're McKinney Vento eligible. Um, unfortunately, the federal law does not define what awaiting foster care means, and so that's left up to the states to define. And so, what, one of the reasons why we're doing this um, the survey is because we want to see what you know how states are defining awaiting foster care placement. Um, are there any bad definitions? Are there more inclusive? Are there more exclusive definitions of awaiting foster care placement? Um, and for those of you who have done work in a in foster care system before, it's it's really dysfunctional. You know, you have a kid who's been cycled through multiple foster care placement, but it, depending on the state's definition, they may not qualify as homeless. If they've already been placed in like a foster home, they may not qualify as homeless, no matter how many times they've been cycled through. And you know, even if they've been put in five different foster homes within like six months, for example, they might not qualify as homeless. So it's a it's it's one of the issues that we're looking into. Um, you can also have homeless LGBTQ youth, and 40% uh, of unaccompanied homeless youth actually identify as LGBTQ. Um, and one thing to recognize and to be mindful of is that this population also encounters additional barriers on top of the barriers that they encounter enrolling and staying and participating in school. Um, you also have immigrant children, English language learners, and limited English proficient students. And students would, whose parents have limited English proficiency. So think about, you know, it, McKinney Vento, said, for example, says that the school needs to provide notice of the student, of the homeless kids' rights under the law. But if you have, you know, students with limited English proficiency or whose parents have limited English proficiency, that becomes problematic. And then uh, I, I believe someone talked about domestic violence survivors. So again, children of domestic violence survivors may qualify as a uh, McKinney Bento eligible if they're experiencing homelessness. So think about families fleeing domestic violence abuse or feeling that fleeing the abuser. You know, once they end up experiencing homelessness, the education rights of those kids become automatically implicated. And then another thing um, is that children or youth who have temporarily lost housing as a result of the disaster also qualify as um, homeless under McKinney Bento. Um, and, you know, most recently we saw this issue come up right after Hurricane Sandy displaced families in, in New York. We've actually gotten requests from schools to suspend the McKin their McKinney Bento obligations. Um, glad that did not happen. So the bottom line is, if you've been displaced, you know, by a natural disaster, for example, you can qualify as homeless under McKinney Bento. And one thing that I, I want to point out is that homelessness disproportionately impacts people of color, particularly African Americans in this country. Um, and, it, and I think it's the same. It's the same is true for each of the sub, subgroups that we just talked about, especially in LGBTQ youth. So a lot of those LGBTQ youth also happen to be uh, students of color. Um, and I think it's just important to be mindful how racial bias can increase the challenges faced by these homeless families, children, and youth of color. And what we really need is you know, a coordinated community response that is trauma-informed and culturally appropriate and developmentally and age appropriate. So trauma informed, so thinking about you know, asking questions like, well, what happened to you versus, well, what's wrong with you? Um, or culturally appropriate, again, thinking about those immigrant students and their parents with limited English proficiency, uh, making sure that the documents uh, that they are required to be provided with uh, are translated in the, their native language. Um, and then developmentally and age appropriate, what I mean by that is thinking about differentiating the needs of younger children and those older uh, and those younger adults or like teenagers, because those two have very different needs, um, especially at school. So now we're going to get into the nitty gritty details of like, OK, so what's the definition of homeless under McKinney Vento? So McKinney Vento says that if you if you lack a fixed, regular an adequate nighttime residence, then you qualify as homeless under McKinney Bento. 
Um, and something to keep in mind is that this is on a case by case basis. So there are no blanket categories that will qualify a, you know, a, a group of people as experiencing homelessness. Um, there's really no checklist on who qualifies as homeless. It has to be done on a case by case basis. And this is the exact definition that the law provides. Um, the law also does a good job of providing other examples. So this, you know, you can draw an analogy if these are like one of the example. If if you're if the client falls in one of these um, living situations, then they most likely qualify as homeless under McKinney-Vento. So if they're living doubled up, right? If they're living with families or like relatives, that's um, that can qualify them as homeless. Um, and the reason why we're not doing it on like the reason why it has to be done on a case by case basis is because you also have to be mindful of the cultural influences. So for example, you know, in, in, in for example, take an Asian family, for example, where collective, where it's big in collectivist culture, right? Some, some families actually tend to live with other families, but if there is an indication that they're living with other families because they are, they are experiencing some financial hardship or because they lost housing, then that should qualify them as homeless under McKinney-Vento. We've heard of some ladies on saying, well, it's in their culture to live with other family members and that's really their decision you know, to live, to have that living arrangement. Therefore, you know, they, don't, they shouldn't qualify as homeless. Well, that's just you know, racist and ignorant. So that's, that's exactly the same, that's the problem that we're trying to avoid and that's why we do it on a case by case basis. Also, if you're living in a hotel or a motel or a trailer park, you can qualify as homeless. So what this says is that you don't have to be living with someone for free or you don't have to be unsheltered to qualify for McKinney Bento. You can you can be paying. Right. You can, and some of these people actually use up their savings before they, you know, before they end up living on the streets or living in their cars. Usually once you see them on the street, unsheltered or living in their cars, that's that, that's like the last resort. Most people, especially with those with families, try to stay indoors, especially during winter. They try to find ways that they can stay you know, with someone, which becomes problematic for many unaccompanied homeless youth because some of them actually exchange sexual favors so that they can find shelter and like live you know, in, indoors and not, you know, be exposed to elements. Um, if you're living in subsidiary housing, you qualify as homeless. If you're, again, if you're awaiting foster care placement, if you're abandoned in the hospital, you qualify as homeless. Uh, any questions? Is this, is this making sense so far or? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Um, all right. So what rights are available? So these are just some of the rights. And the reason why I'm if you actually read the language of the law, it doesn't make it's not apparent that they're rights, that they're, they're McKinney-Vento rights. Um, we call them rights because our executive director, Maria Foscarinas, back in the early 90s, sued the D.C. public school system for failing to comply with McKinney-Vento. And one of the questions that the court, the D.C. circuit had to address at the time was, was there a private cause of action? And the result. So we, we won that case. Um, DC public school system was found not in compliance with McKinney Vento. Um, what they did though is that they pulled out of the funding. So they stopped getting funding from McKinney Vento and that's how they were able to circumvent the, or the, the court order. Um, but part of that decision also was that there is a private cause of action under McKinney Vento. And that's why now we're, you know, we, we call them as rights available to homeless families and children. Uh, and what this, what, what that means is that, you know, they can, families and children are free to sue school districts if they're not in compliance with, with McKinney Vento. But unfortunately, as I said before, a lot of these families don't have access to legal resources. They don't have access to attorneys. And chances are because they're so poor and they're, and they don't have other resources, they're, they're stuck with the dispute resolution process that the school actually implements. And we'll get to that in the next couple of slides. But they're stuck with whatever, whatever the school says them says that they have to do, um, which is very, very distressing and alarming. Um, so these are just some of the rights available. So again, the right to remain the school of origin, even if they move. So the school of origin is the school that they were attending, last attending before they experienced homelessness. They also have the right to enroll in any public school where other non-homeless kids are, atten are attending or are eligible to attend. So think about, you know, we using that exa old example. So if you have that Chicago, that student who moved from Chicago and living temporarily with a family friend in, uh, in 
Chicago suburb, they can enroll in the, in the Chicago, in the suburb school um, under McKinney Vento. They also have the right to immediately enroll in a new school uh, without typically a required record. So if they're missing, you know, a birth certificate or a proof of residence or an immunization record, they should be able to qualify. Uh, they should be able to enroll under McKinney Vento as long as they're qualified as homeless. Um, and again, this goes back to the original intent of the law to provide con educational continuity and stability for homeless children, right? So the idea is that deal, you know, enroll the kids first, make sure that they're they're getting the education that they need, and then deal with the problems later on. They also have the right to participate fully in school activities. So this includes you know, extracurricular activities, or if you're going on field trips, or if you're you know doing if you're if you have sports offered at school. Um, and in some instances, if there is a fee that is required for students in order to participate in these activities, the under McKinney Vento, they should be providing. There should be a mechanism that they. There, sh there should be a mechanism so that they can provide fee waivers for, for families experiencing homelessness. Um, they also have the right to receive transportation to and from school related activities. And we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, they have the right to receive related school services that they may need. So for example, you know, before school or after school tutoring services. Um, those are, I mean, those are some of the services that they may need. Um, if they also need like school uniforms, that can, you know, that can be covered under McKinney Vento as well. Um, and finally, and most importantly, I think for many lawyers is that they have the right to dispute decisions made by schools and school districts. So, for example, if they disagree, you know, that the school, if they disagree with the school's decision not to enroll the kid, for example, they have the right to dispute that decision. And we'll get through the dispute resolution process in, in the next couple of slides. No questions so far? You're, you guys are okay? Yep. Sounds like it, right? Okay. So which schools do students experiencing homelessness attend? So that's a, that's a very important question to ask. Um, so school placement decisions are made according to the child's best interest. Uh, and again, this determination is very fact specific, very fact intensive, and it has to be done on a case by case basis. Um, there is a presumption under the law that attending the school of origin, the last school that they were attending before they, became, they experienced homelessness, that's the, that that's the best school that they should be attending, um, unless it's contrary to the wishes of the child or the parent. Um, other feasibility factors may also lead to a decision that the best school to attend is a new school. Um, and that, that, I mean, that's usually a conversation to be had with the parent because you have to take into account, you know, if the student has a disability, for example, or if the new school is much, much closer than the older school. Um, you also have to account at the age of the child. If the, if the child is just, you know, it, it, if it's a young child and they just started school, um, I think it's okay to switch schools versus if you have like a child that's graduating, you know, that's on sixth grade or like on, 11th grade and they're or in, on 12th grade and you know you need to it, it, it'd probably be better for those children to just stay in the same school because they already have their friends and their support networks um, rather than having them sent to having them sent into a new school um, the bottom line is the school's decision has to be put in writing and it has to include an information about the right of the parent or the child to appeal that decision so there are some due process guarantees under McKinney, built into the McKinney Vento through the dispute resolution process. Um, so in terms of you know participating in school, this is what this is what McKinney Vento says. Uh, it actually defines what enrollment means. Enroll means permitting the student to attend classes and participate fully in school activities, including extracurricular activities such as sports or participating in field, school field trips. And, you know, again, give it, there, there's a requirement under McKinney Bento to remove policies that act as barriers. So schools may need, to, again, may need to provide fee waivers so that they can facilitate access to some of these school programs. And in terms of transportation, um, this is actually a very, very controversial part of the law. Part of it is because it's very, very expensive to some schools. And McKin let's face it, you know, McKinney Vento funding is not unlimited. There, it, it's very, it's, it varies state by state on how much money each school district can get. It's usually through competitive subgrants that they, that school districts are able to get funding from McKinney Vento. 
Um, and there are other additional funding streams that schools can tap into um, to meet the McKinney Bento transportation requirement. But nonetheless, this is like some one of the most expensive parts of compliance. Um, we've heard schools paying cab rides, um, paying for cab rides so that they can actually comply with the law. And I think there is an example in Seattle um, where the school district was um, singled out for spending $30,000 just for transporting like several, like a few homeless students. It, it was crazy. But again, it, what it boils down to is it can be very expensive. So there's three ways that you can provide transportation to a homeless student once they're McKinney Vento eligible. So first, if it's the school of origin, the if, if they're attending the school of origin and they're, you know, and they're located outside the school district, but they want to attend the school, this, the, the school of origin, the school has to provide transportation um, upon the request of the family or the, the student. So that's, you know, it's non-negotiable. There is an affirmative obligation under the law to provide transportation if the kid is living outside the school district but want to attend the school of origin. Now, if they're attending a new school, so let's say they want, you know, going back to our old example, if they want to attend the new school in the suburb, in the Chicago suburb, they can do so. And they're, they're not guaranteed transportation unless that school district is actually providing transportation to other non-homeless kids. Um, so if they are providing school buses for, for other students living in the area, they have to provide transportation to homeless kids as well. Um, one of the overarching obligations under McKinney Vento, which I forgot to mention in the beginning, is that there is a duty not to stigmatize homeless students. And so we take that, we read that as a confidentiality, right? You have to be, you have to keep the status of being experiencing homelessness as confidential. So that confidentiality requirement applies not just to to many many school staff and personnel. So it it applies to the staff interfacing directly with homeless students, the, the school bus operator. So they have to, you know, some of these schools actually have to develop transportation plan for the homeless kids. So what we find is that we, they usually drop off, they usually pick up this, the homeless students first, especially if they're living in a shelter, uh, so that they, so that other students can find out that these students are experiencing homelessness. Um, or, and they get dropped off last after everybody else has been dropped off. Um, so that's the duty not to stigmatize. Um, the third is, again, the overarching obligation to remove barriers. So this is where a lawyer comes in handy, is that if you have a legal advocate that says, well, attending, you know, attending this school really is a barrier because the parent doesn't have a car, they don't have enough money to actually pay for, you know, public transportation, you can argue that that is a barrier and that the school must provide transportation. Um, again, this is on a case by case basis. So in terms of who needs to implement and comply with the law, there are two main actors that you probably run across as you go through like your analysis. So the main players are there's a state coordinator. So each state educational agency is required to have a state coordinator for the homeless education. And their job is to ensure that the school district, the local school districts are in compliance with McKinney Bento. Um, and then on the local level, the law requires that each district has to have a homeless liaison. And the homeless liaison is in charge of ensuring that students, the homeless students can enroll and succeed in school. One of their biggest um, jobs and duties under the McKinney Bento is to identify homeless students. Um, so if you're, in, you know, just think about that position, for example, if you're a homeless liaison and you're trying to identify students living, um, living doubled up with family members or relatives, that, that it, it is a very, very difficult population to identify and target. So they, it, the, the, the way they identify um, in, can vary from state to state and school district to school district. So, you know, it just depends on how great the homeless liaison is. Um, one thing to note, though, is that McKinney Venture doesn't actually specify how with the procedures in terms of hiring a homeless liaison. So many of these homeless liaisons actually work for the same school districts and schools that are in potential violation of McKinney Vento. So what we've heard, at least, you know, if we find some egregious violations of McKinney Vento, it's usually a homeless liaison whistleblowing on the school district. So they will call us and say, I don't want to be involved. And they can't do a lot of advocacy around on behalf of the homeless kids because they're all, 
the the school district that's violating the law is the one issuing their paychecks as well. So it's very, very problematic in many cases because that's usually the case. And many of these homeless liaisons are also there. Many of them are part time. They usually also work as a guidance counselor for the school. Some are superintendents. And so, again, if you're, you know, if you're trying to advocate for the homeless kid, but at the same time working for the school, there is a lot of conflict of interest going on. In terms of you know, decisions that can be appealed, any adverse determination that is related to, that is related to McKinney Bento can be appealed. Um, so the most common, I mean, the most common appeals involve decisions about you know, school choice, school enrollment and participation, especially if you, you know, determining well, what's, the, what's in the child's best interest, for example. Um, fee waivers, so if the school is, the, is refusing to provide fee waivers so that the kid can participate in extracurricular activities or sports, that can be appealed. Um, guardianship requirements. Um, Transportation is also like one of the most frequently appealed decisions um, issued by the school. So these are just most the, these are some of the issues that are most commonly appealed. Um, but the bottom line is other barriers can be appealed as well. So if you're seeing that something is a barrier to the you know to attend a barrier experienced by homeless children in attending, participating, and staying in school, that can be argued and appealed with the school or the school district. Um, and you're probably asking, you know, how can unfavorable decisions be appealed? Well, each state is required to have a process in place for prompt resolution of disputes. So if there is a dispute about the enrollment, for example, the child must be immediately enrolled in the school in which the enrollment is sought until a full and final resolution of the dispute. And this is um, this is actually called the pendency requirement. So what McKinney Vento says is that, again, McKinney Vento wants educational continuity and stability for the kid. So if there is a dispute, what's, you know, whatever the dispute is, the kid has to be enrolled in where the kid wants to attend. And then they have to stay enrolled while the dispute is ongoing. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't define like when that, that, that the dispute has been resolved when the when's the final part of the dispute. Um, so if you know, for example, if there's if the state already issues a a final decision on a on an appeal, that doesn't mean that it's final final because if there is a lawyer involved, if there's a legal representative on behalf of the families, they can still sue in court because if because McKinney Vento is now part, you know, there is a private cause of action under McKinney Vento. So what, if that happens, then the school still needs to enroll the family while that lawsuit is ongoing. So it just doesn't stop in the dispute resolution process. We believe that if there is a lawsuit or a pending lawsuit, then the kid still needs to be enrolled um, under dependency provision of McKinney Vento. Um, these are just some of the education related laws, and these are all included in the No Barriers Manual, which I'll send to you guys after our call um, if you haven't seen it. Um, so FERPA, the first one, deals with privacy laws. Um, what that says is that student, you know, families are entitled to, the parents are entitled to reviewing the records of their children. Um, they have the right to inspect and review education records. Um, certain individuals must obtain parental permission prior to sharing information to a third party. So, you know, if you're a school official, for example, you're thinking about sharing the student's information, they have to think twice because they might be a violation of PERPA. Um, Head Start just applies to early to preschoolers. Um, and unfortunately, McKinney Vento mentions preschoolers, but they don't offer McKinney Vento doesn't offer the same rights. Um, for preschoolers as it does for K through 12 students. So a lot of the students under McKinney Vento are K through 12 students. What McKinney Vento says um, for preschoolers is that if the school is, you know, provide, it has to be, the school has to provide comparable services to other non-homeless kids. So if this, if the preschool is providing transportation to non-homeless, to, to permanently house kids, they have to provide um, transportation to homeless kids as well. Um, but if they're not providing that, they don't have to provide it um, for homeless 
students, regardless of their situation. So going back to the transportation requirement, right? One of the requirements is that if you're a school of origin and this, the kid is attending a different, you know, is living in a different school district, but they still want to attend the school, the school of origin, they have to provide transportation under McKinney Bento. Um, but if you're a preschool, you know, and the and the the student is living outside the school district, and they want to attend the preschool of origin. McKinney Bento says that if they're not providing it, if they're not providing transportation to other permanently housed kids, they don't have to provide transportation to the homeless preschooler as well. So that's the big difference. Um, there's also fostering connections to success and increasing adoptions act that really deals with um, kids awaiting foster care. Um, this is also there's a lot of implementation problems with this law, um, and many many school districts are actually unaware of this this particular law. Um, individuals with disabilities in the Education Act again, that's just saying that individuals with disabilities are also entitled to free, appropriate public education, just as that they are just as they are um, entitled to under McKinney Vento. And again, there's a lot of parallels between IDEA and McKinney Vento. So, uh, for example, un under IDEA, um, there is a child find mandate requiring schools to identify potentially, you know, students with potential disabilities. So under McKinney Vento, that obligation falls under homeless liaison. So they have the duty not to identify um, homeless students entitled under McKinney Vento. Um, there's the Child Nutrition Act that just says that once you're identified as homeless, you automatically qualify for free and reduced price meals at school, which is very important because a lot of these students actually, their only meals are like, you know, during breakfast when they go to school and during lunch. Um, and then they don't really know when the next food is coming until the next day when they go to school. Um, Title I, Part A of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, that's just the No Child Left Behind, and that really is focused on low on schools with high concentrations of low-income students, um, and that's just an additional source of funding. Um, Violence Against Women Act, we talked about the intersection between homelessness and domestic violence, so that's something that we also consider. Um, there's also non-discrimination laws that are applicable to some of the homeless students. So think about students being discriminated, homeless students being discriminated because of their disability, or if someone at school retaliates because they file a complaint with the, um, with the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights because of that disability, um, they're protected under non-discrimination laws. Or if there's an LGBT student being, homeless student being discriminated because of their gender identity or sexual orientation, that's actionable um, under, that's protected under, under um, federal and state non-discrimination laws. And finally, there's like state laws and regulations that you should really consider. And that's what we're looking, that's one of the metrics that we're looking in uh, for the 50 state analysis. Any questions so far? Okay, moving on. So now I just wanna talk about some of the challenges that we've seen. Um, on the federal level, the biggest challenge really is this two competing definitions between um, the Department of Education and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So we talked about the Department of Education's definition, which is the McKinney-Vento um, definition. And that focus, that focus that's very broad because it includes individuals living doubled up, living in hotels and motels. Um, HUD's definition tends to be much, much narrower. It really focuses on those individuals who are unsheltered, who are living on the streets or who are, you know, an imminent, who, who's facing imminent threat of homelessness. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that what's problematic is because even if you have these homeless liaisons identifying these homeless kids, sometimes they can't really provide additional housing support because many of those kids are not eligible under the, because of the HUD's def much na much narrower definition of homelessness. Um, I forgot, I don't have the exact statistic, but I think only 20% of those students identified by homeless liaisons at school qualify for housing support um, under the Department of Housing and Urban Development definition of homelessness. And the two systems don't really share, you know, they, they don't really share data, which is problematic. Um, HUD, HUD takes the stance, um, that they want to prioritize 
um, the limited resources that they have. So they want to focus on those individuals living on the streets versus those living those individuals living on the uh, living doubled up, for example. Um, well, I just I disagree with that view. I think everybody else is entitled to um, some form of support, um, and that's actually one of the biggest you know gaps between local between advocates um, working for HUD and working um, for a Department of Education. And there's also capacity strain and lack of oversight. So the GAO um, Government Accountability Office came out with a, with a report last July 2014 saying that McKinney Vento uh, that, that the McKinney Vento program needs additional oversight because there's really no efficient system in place to track and monitor states um, and whether they're in compliance with the law. So um, many of these states have not been um, monitored in the past few years, so unclear whether they're actually following McKinney Vento. And then on the state level, um, what we're seeing is that there's a lot of inconsistent application and reading of the law. So again, for example, the awaiting foster care placement, um, we it, it depends on each state, but some states don't have implementing statutes or regulations. They just follow McKinney Vento. Uh, but when you actually look at the practices of schools and local school districts, you'll see like they're actually not in compliance with McKinney Vento. Um, there's also a lack of enforcement mechanism under McKinney Vento. So, you know, unlike civil rights laws, for example, there's no office for civil rights that you can call and enforce and protect the rights of homeless children and youth. Um, they can't just call the Department of Education and file a complaint. That's not the case for McKinney Vento. Whereas for students with disabilities that, you know, they, they, they have a number that they can call, but, um, and it's usually tied in with the Office for Civil Rights. Or if you're an LGBTQ student and you have a school who, you know, denies you, and you're, you're for example, you're a trans, you're a homeless transgender student trying to use the female bathroom because you're a trans woman, um, there are, and the school refuses to do that, to, you know, to accommodate your needs, then there is a number that they can call, again, Office for Civil Rights, that they can file a complaint, and the, the, the Office for Civil Rights can open an invest, investigation and then provide some relief and remedy for the student. Um, that's not the case for McKinney Vento at all. So there are rights guaranteed under McKinney Vento, but there's the Department of Education really lacks the resources and I guess like mandate, um, statutory mandate to provide, um, to enforce and implement the, the relevant provisions. And then on the local level, we're seeing the same problems and, you know, again, many schools and staff and res um, have limited staff and resources. And so they're, they have very limited ability to provide technical assistance and services to families. What we're seeing most, the most common problem we're seeing is that many of these school personnel, especially those who um, directly interface with students are unaware of McKinney Vento. So um, what, uh, um, a common complaint is that, you know, a homeless family shows up at the school to enroll the kid, the school staff will just ask, well, where's your proof of residence? Where are all these requirements? Um, they don't even get to ask, you know, are you are you experiencing homelessness? And usually it's not the case, because again, there is that duty not to stigmatize fam homeless families and kids. And so they, they there are a set of questions that they have to ask to figure out what if the, if the family is experiencing homelessness, right? So it is, in a homelessness in that regard is that it's a legal definition, so you need to meet certain um, certain questions. You have to answer certain questions before you can actually make that legal determination that a, a, a person or a family or a child is experiencing homelessness. Usually they ask, well, you know, where, what's your housing situation like, right? So for most of the staff dealing with these kids directly, like they don't have that knowledge at all. So many of these families are like turned away and are, are unable to like enroll or stay in the same school. And again, what as, as I said as I said before, you know, there's a lot of conflict of interest happening at the local level. So the homeless liaisons work part time, and they usually work for the same school districts that are in potential violation of McKinney Mento. Um, so there's a lot of conflicts going on in there. Um, this is, I mean, this is just something to consider as well. Um, there are laws that criminalize homeless youth. Um, so I think um, one of the associates talked about the San Diego Homeless Court. So there are laws. So when I talk about criminalization of homelessness, I'm talking about laws that 
criminally punish those individuals experiencing homelessness for, you know, committing life-sustaining acts in public. So, for example, sleeping on the streets. Like, right, there's like anti-camping ordinances enacted all over the country. And it's, it's very, very common. They're trying to hide poverty in certain, in like, you know, in touristy areas. So they enact these like ordinances where people are not allowed to stay, you know, for a certain number of hours in certain parts of the city. Um, or they're not allowed to sleep. They're not allowed to pee. They're not allowed to defecate. So it's, it's really, really distressing. And what we're trying to say is that the, those laws that criminalize youth homelessness also act as barriers that, uh, and create more barriers for children to attend, um, for children to be able to attend and participate in school. Um, so there is a um, litigation section on the, on the manual, the no barriers manual, and the, the most common subjects include, you know, again, failure to remove barriers to the enrollment, participation, and um, the enrollment participation of homeless children at school. Um, some of the remedies that um, are commonly sought are like monetary damages. Um, temporary restraining orders and injunctions are very, very common because we want to make sure that schools are in compliance with the pendency provision under McKinney Vento. Um, so while the dispute is ongoing, we want to make sure that the kid is you know, able to attend the same school um, during the pendency of the, the litigation. And many of the cases settle, which is very, very problematic because once the injunction is issued, these the school districts are more likely to settle. And so there are no court records available. And so we just rely on other partners who work specifically in the Vento education issues to share some of their briefs, some of the complaints that they filed in their states so that we can see what's going on on the ground. Um, some of the important themes from the cases, and these are just some of them, there's a lot more, but I just wanna highlight this because it, actually clarifies what the law is. So again, you know, McKinney Vento is a federal law, so it preempts any conflicting state laws um, and applies to every district within the state that receives McKinney Vento funding. And that basically applies to every school, public school in, in, in some charter schools in, in across the country. Um, it is privately enforceable, so students and families can sue school districts in the state if they want to. Um, but again, you know, there's limited access to re legal resources and counsel. Um, so many of these families are just forced to deal, to follow the dispute resolution process, which in some cases can be unfair. Um, the third one is that there's no time limit on homelessness. So um, what we're finding is that many of these um, Many of these school districts and schools say, well, you've been homeless for six months now. I think, you know, the fact that you're still living with, you know, a friend means that, that that's turned into a permanent, you know, living situation, um, which is certainly not the case. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing that pushback from school districts. And there have been a few cases saying that there's no time limit on homelessness. Um, and finally, the cost of homelessness is irrelevant, right? Like, the, and again, this is your, if you're a homeless liaison or your school district or, you know, or a state coordinator, your job is to really follow the law. You're not there to pass judgment on people and why they ended up experiencing homelessness. And as I said before, there are many reasons why individuals experience homelessness. It can be because of domestic violence, it can be a foreclosure, it can be a medical emergency. Um, so the cost of homelessness is irrelevant. Um, this is one of the cases in um, in the in the manual. Um, I do want to you know, I just want to give you a flavor of how these problems manifest in case law. So, taking this as an example, um, more details are available in the in the manual. Uh, but to summarize, you know, this was a case filed in New York in 2011. Ch had two kids. The kids were living with the mother when the mother lost her home due to foreclosure proceedings in 2010, um, and they lived in a shelter but was later discharged. Um, CH then took the kids to live with their aunt. So this is a family member. They living the, doubled up outside the school district. So what I'm about to show you now is like how the school addressed the problem. Well, first of all, they disenrolled the, the children. And mind you, one of the kids actually had like a severe disability. Um, and so the fact that the, the schooling was being interrupted was just so caused a lot of ir irreparable harm on that kid. Um, the school also advised um, 
you know, the dad that McKinney Mento will be of no aid. They failed to refer them to a homeless liaison and told them that the appeal would be unsuccessful. Um, finally, when the parent, when CH showed up to school, at school to, you know, to drop off his, his um, kids, the school called the police they, to refuse entry um, to CH. And then they had like this public meeting discussing CH's, you know, experience of homelessness on the street in public. So this whole, I mean, this is a pretty egregious case and, you know, eventually the, 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 the school district settled. Um, but this is just a flavor of how these, you know, non-compliance issues pop up in litigation. So now we're going to talk about the metrics and the, um, points of comparison. So these are just some of the, this, I already talked to Christine about this, but these are the metrics that we looked into um, in the past. Um, there's the funding, the questions about funding, there's questions about staffing, early childhood, um, there's access and success, which just refers to the number of policies or practices to award you know, partial credits, for example, um, number of policies or practices to ensure full participation. Um, there's a Title I, um, metric, which looks at the trends and policies and practicing on calculating the mandatory Title I set aside funds. Um, that goes into, I mean, that, that's more specific, and I'm happy to talk more about that, whoever is dealing with that particular issue. Um, there's the dispute resolution process, and again, this is very important because it deals with access to justice issues. Um, and if the families don't have access to legal resources and attorneys, so the dispute resolution has to be, you know, it has to. We have to make sure that it's fair across the board. Um, there's monitoring and technical assistance. Um, there's issues about charter schools, um, state implementing statutes, um, regulations and guidance, um, and then state policies and services. And finally, definitions, right? So for example, how do each state define homelessness? Or do they even define homeless youth? Are they, you know, do, how do they define awaiting foster care? So these are some of the comparisons that we want to see. Um, so this list is definitely not ex exclusive. Um, I'm open to other ways that you can compare the states based on each metric or measure. Um, and, um, just as a background, Eric Tars, the senior attorney who's uh, staff attorney here at the law center, approached this from the bottom up. But I think it would have been helpful to look at the metrics first, how we want to compare um, across the board and see what needs to be compared so that we can determine what information we should be obtaining. So some of the metrics probably are missing information. Uh, so you might have to go back and talk to the authors. Um, um, to the past folks who worked on, on, on the memos. Um, cause I don't think, I, I don't know if they actually thought about, you know, the, com the upcoming comparison and analysis part. So just as a, you know, as a heads up, you might have to go back, um, if, especially if they're missing some information. And I know for a dispute resolution process, a lot of them just refer to the compilation that we have online. Um, we don't know if that's actually, you know, if, some of those have been outdated um, on how, or how updated those are, uh, but that's something that you have to, you know, you might have to look into. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to let the group know that I have been in touch with everybody who's prepared the memos, and there have been some folks who have told me that they were not able to kind of respond to the questions for clarification on their state subjects. So if if anybody comes across an area where they, they need some clarification, you can reach out to that person, but um, reach out to me and I can help you get the information because a lot of the people have kind of expressed to me that they have no more time to work on this before the year is up. So just wanted to throw that out there that I'm here if anybody needs help with that. Right. So, and, and, and again, and, and you might have, I mean, you definitely have to do that because I think one of the part, one part of the memo that we want to look into is like how, you know, how they came about describing the metrics, right? How data was collected for each metric, um, any limitations that they had. Um, a lot of this is just like doing desk review, uh, looking at cases, like doing some online research. But uh, apart from that, they didn't really do anything, you know, more substantive, but such as, you know, talking to, I think some of them actually tried to reach out to some of the state coordinators, but they were unable to. So that's something that, you know, we need to list for each, um, for each of the metrics. Um, 
but I think that's that's it. Do you guys have questions? How, uh, Christina? I know how you want to divide this up, but um, I know we uh, had mentioned like I think what was the number? What was the estimated number of hours that I gave you? Was it fifty or? I think it was around twenty, twenty-five. Okay, it might be higher than that, depending you know again depending on like how much work, how much you have to go back and ask those folks. Um, it might be closer to like fifty, seventy-five. Okay. Um, so that being said, we can always bring on, I just know a lot of people are really busy before the end of the year, so it might be a lot to ask of everyone to get done before the year is over. Mm -hmm. um, so we may need to rope in some more people, but we can maybe kind of divide up stuff right now and kind of see how things start to go and how long things may take once we start going. Yeah, I think once you actually start like looking at, you know, like across the board for just for funding, for example, you can get an idea of like what's going on, what's missing. And I think you can you'd be in a better place to evaluate like how long it's going to take to actually get that, you know, get that up to speed. Um, because Christine and I actually, you know, I mean, I joined the law center after this project has already been conceived and started. And I think Christine did the uh, we're in the same spot. As, I'm in the same spot as Christine. So we're, we're, you know, we're new to the project, but we're just continuing and picking up where Megan, you were left off in the past and where Eric Tars has left off. And again, I don't think those attorneys were, you know, thinking about like doing the analysis part. So they were probably not in the same mentality as you guys are, where you're trying to do all these comparison, you know, between states. Um, Christine, were you able to share the alone without a home with them or? Yeah. Okay. I sent it out on Friday. Um, I sent it out kind of late, so I don't know if everybody's gotten a chance to look at it yet. But yeah, so that's sort of like I mean that's the end product, and you know we're not expecting a full report on that, but that's that should give you an idea of like how we want to do the state comparison. So we want to see like who you know what are the best practices or. You know, are there any outliers out there or are there any trends that most states are doing? Uh, how are, I mean, if, if, for example, you know, are, you know, is there a certain percentage of, is there a per certain percentage of states that define awaiting foster care in this, you know, in, in one sense or another? So those are the kind of comparisons that we want to see because eventually at the end result is that we want this to be a resource. You know, we're, we're definitely going to turn it into a report, but we want to see it, we want to develop it to, as, a, as a resource for, you know, advocates and also school districts so that they can see like how they do, how they compare to other states. The idea behind is that you know we'll we'll be able to you know once the the memo is final and there's a the analysis is available we'll be able to make some key recommendations overall right like we'll be able to recommend like this should be what your dispute resolution should include make sure that it's fair it's you know equitable for all parties involved um, trying to address those you know conflicts of interest going on with the local homeless liaison for example. So that's the kind of definition. I mean, that's the kind of like comparison that we want to see. And again, it, very, it will vary from, you know, for each metric. But as soon as you want, I don't know how you guys want to divvy this up, but these are like some of the, you know, the, the metrics that we're going to put in the, in the, the memo. Yeah, um, I am not really sure how to divvy it up either. I guess we could, you know, distribute just the metrics equally amongst everyone. I'm not sure if you have a better yeah, idea. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. And I understand like you guys are, you know, you guys, some of you have to go and soon. Um, I'm happy to do a follow up call because um, some of these, some of these go into detail and there's like some other statutes involved. And so I'm happy to walk you through that as well. So once you've divided it up, I'm happy to do like individual calls with folks as they go through the man, through the analysis. Great, thank you. And hopefully the, the the presentation was helpful. So I wasn't sure how you know eye opening that is, but it, it's a lot of. I mean, you know, this is a very it's a very niche area of law, and there's a lot of issues involved. Um, so I understand that you know it can be a little confusing. But if you have questions, follow up questions. Um, just my uh, actually, let me give you my contact. That's my contact information. So if you have any other follow up questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thank you. So probably the next steps is, uh, will be I can divide up those metrics for everyone and um, kind of just assign them to people. And then 
um, you know, I'll probably create some type of template for people to start, a, you know, accumulating their work and then everyone can feel free to reach out to Michael if they have questions or we can set up another call or just kind of, if right, they, right. you guys feel like you need anything, just let me know. And I think the first, the very first step to do is actually track down how, like, what the methodology was, because that's something that we'll definitely, I mean, I'm also curious how they found out, like, you know, how they populated the, um, the information from each memo. Because there is a template they followed, um, but it was, you know, they, we really didn't talk about how they went about, like, doing the research, whether they tried to call state coordinators um, or, like, homeless liaisons. So that's something that you should probably look into, develop the methodology section. Um, for each of the metric, just so you can get, you can also probably get an idea of like how much time will, you know, it will entail in terms of developing the analysis. Great. Sounds like a plan. Anything, any other questions? I know um, we covered a lot, but yeah, let me know. This is Catherine. Um, Michael, um, very good presentation, very thorough. Um, I've learned a lot. <laughs> So I don't know if this is a better question for you or Christine. Um, I may have missed something in the email correspondence as we've been kind of ramping up to this, but so there's these, there's a matrix of categories that we want to compare, and then there's a series of memos that have been written by attorneys previously. Have we seen or have those memos been circulated yet? So those memos are all saved on worksite um, and I can give you um, like the step-by-step -step instructions of what folder they're located under but you can access them all there um, okay. and I can kind of send out a clarifying email to say you know this is what you should be looking at oh that's that's fine I just want to know so if they're in worksite then we can pull those and start reviewing that information and are those um, are the memos on different subjects than are they on, you know, more specific subjects, different subjects, but it, it's interweaved or overlaps with the points of comparison that we're going to be addressing in our project? So, so I think... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Michael. No, I was going to say, like, so we had, like, a, a, I don't know how many people, how many attorneys volunteered for that initial project, but, you know, each attorney basically dealt with one state, and they look at the state... Mm -hmm. And they identify all the metrics. So basically, they are enumerated the metrics for each state. So you look, you look at the funding, right? How much funding is each state and each school district is getting? How many school districts are actually getting funding under McKinney Vento? What's the staff, staffing situation for you know, the District of uh, Columbia, for example? Um, what are the early childhood education issues? Um, what's the Title I funding situation? What's the dispute resolution process like for DC? So that's how it was organized. Um, not, not, not like you know, having one person just look into one metric and then do a state by state comparison. It hasn't gone. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Again, again. That's what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah. So it might. That's why it's it's tricky because I, I don't think when this project was initially you know started, I don't think they were looking into the comparison part. They were just looking at collecting information. Um, okay. But in retrospect, you know, I do and I do apologize. Uh, in retrospect, I think it would it should have been. We should; those people should have been looking at the comparison and analysis part, so that they can actually know, you know, which information to collect. So it it, it can get tricky. Is what I'm saying. So in case it's it's not clear, each person before did a, a memo on each state covering, you know, kind of all the metrics for one state. So what we're planning to do is, each person will have. The metrics, and so you'll look at, you know, all 50 states, or you know, and including Puerto Rico, and looking at the metrics for each of those. So you'll be looking at all of the states on just a few categories. Is that what you were imagining, Michael? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then I think as a as a as a template, you can look at the alone without a home because it does a good job of like these are like the 50 state like these are the laws across 50 states and this is what we've seen these are the trends you know and I think in some parts of it like they do charts and graphs so well I mean it doesn't mean that we'll be able to do that right like that's that's the goal that's one of the reasons why we're doing this we're trying to figure out if there's a you know if there's going to be a, a need for even you know doing pie charts and graphs because if there is a trend that we're seeing. We want to note that.
Uh, no questions? I do want to say thank you for ever, to everyone for, you know, volunteering for this project. I know it's like end of the year, but hopefully, you know, we'll be able to make some progress on this. Um, we are looking into getting it done as soon as possible. Um, the original due date was actually April 2015. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, Christine, is that, is that Christine? Yeah. Yeah, so we laugh because it's been stalled and it's been protracted. Um, part of this because um, we didn't have like a full-time education attorney at the law center before I joined, so that was like seven months ago. Um, and so no one really was like focusing on this project per se. So now that I'm here as a full-time staff, um, I'm, you know, I'm available to answer all, all the questions and get this project moving forward. All right, so I don't think there, there's any other questions. Um, yeah, so I think Christine will follow up with you guys um, with the memos and I guess, I, I, what, Christine, when do you think we should do another like, when when should we touch base in two weeks? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be great. That way, people can you know start to dig in, and if they're coming across anything or have any good resources, we can you know touch base with each other. So I think in a couple of weeks would be really good. Okay, all right, I'll do that. Um, again, thank you guys so much. We'll be in touch. Enjoy the holiday weekend. Um, and um, Christine, if you need someone else to join, I think um, where are people? Where 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 is everyone from? I know you're in Chicago. Is there anyone? Is there anyone from New York? I don't think so. Okay, because uh, Terry Peoples from New York actually expressed interest. She was a uh, she did we did a legal clinic last week um, for homeless children and youth in Queens, and she said she's interested. So if you need more people to contact, um, you know, she might be able. Oh, great. Maybe. Okay, yeah, I will keep you posted on that. I'll check in with everyone and see if we think that's what we need. We probably will need a, a, some, a little bit more manpower behind it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I guess like the 25 hours, that's, I was thinking like billable hours, which probably will end up more, <laughs> twice as more. So um, let me know if, if yeah, let, just keep me posted in terms of the bandwidth of the group and if more, you know, if you guys need more time, I understand. Um, the only concern that I want to flag for you guys is it, it, this was a, the deadline was April 2015 uh, because um, there's a, this is tied into a grant that we and we promised the grant the, the the funder that we will have something by March 1st next year so that is the ultimate deadline um, and so the reason why we want to make this do like the end of the year or like early you know early January is because we want to make sure that we cover all our bases and see if there's actual report that we need to publish and that will give me time to turn that around and generate like an actual report that we can send to the to the funder we can do that all right thank you guys again if you have any questions shoot me an email or just call me I'm, I'm here I'm available um, and December for me should be a lot quieter than the next than the past few months so so we'll, we'll be in touch in two weeks. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks so much, Michael. Bye. Bye.